Hey, it's Dave Brown here, host of Now with Dave Brown on AMI. Check out this latest highlight from the show. The gradual banning of single-use plastics is underway in Canada. A new law went into effect in late December. The federal government is starting by eliminating the manufacturing and importing of some plastic products. Think of things like plastic bags, cutlery, takeout containers, stir sticks, and straws. The sale of these items will still be allowed until December of 2023. Plastic bags for garbage, organic waste, and recycling will still be allowed. The banning of plastic items is a policy that could, and will, disproportionately impact people with disabilities. Let's dive into it with Marco Pasqua and Elizabeth Moeller. Hey, good morning, Marco. Good morning, Dave. And hello, Elizabeth. Good morning, Dave. So, Elizabeth, starting with you, there are some considerable disability concerns related to a plastic ban. But before we, you get into those, what's your reaction to the policy more broadly? Yeah, when I when I was reading this policy, I really was struck by the environmental injustice. So when we think about the term environmental justice, we look at how environmentalism disproportionately impacts certain groups and how certain groups experience the risks and benefits of environmentalism a little bit differently. And my reaction was that this policy was put in place and was constructed without consulting a number of different community groups and was done so from an environmentalism lens and not an environmental justice lens. So environmental justice sort of taking its core tenets from social justice and equity studies. And so I, I thought two things. The first is, who are we excluding and how are we excluding them? But the second thing I thought is, the policy itself, I don't think is addressing the bigger issues that we have with our climate. Plastics is certainly a big part, for sure, when we think about plastic rings, of environmental degradation and harm. But there's a lot more that goes into it. And so I think the policy is is narrow in scope and didn't consult a lot of community groups in its in its construction and its development. It's it's hard to add too much more to that, Elizabeth. I think you've identified a lot of the key issues that exist there. I, I do want to say here, though, outright and objectively, that plastic waste is a big problem, and it's one that is certainly worth addressing. But again, the concerns that sit around this policy do make it quite interesting and quite meaningful fodder. And before we jump into all of those, Marco, I want to give you an opportunity to react to the policy at a, at a broader perspective. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I think that uh, for me, the whole reason why plastic was originally you know, used was to help with deforest deforesting, right? So my question is, why is it plastic bags and straws that are considered the first, you know, um, uh, things to be on the chopping block, so to speak? Yes, you can still access these things, but you have to basically seem to know a secret code when you go into grocery stores to ask them. Um, you know, they didn't want to completely phase it out. And as Elizabeth said, I think this could have been addressed in a much more meaningful and an impactful way by addressing and, and really consulting the disability community and doing it in much more of a phased approach. I mean, why is it that we still go to the grocery store and see a single cucumber wrapped in plastic while this plastic ban is going on? Or you, you'll go to get four tomatoes and they'll have it in a clamshell packaging, uh, which still utilizes plastic in some ways, right? So the fact that we're approaching this, and in the article that Elizabeth shared prior to this, it said that plastic straws sold in uh, with 20 or more will be allowed, but they won't be on retail shelves. So like I said at the beginning of my comments here, you actually have to be able to go to the back and ask for it like an illicit product, <laughs> which I think is a reduction on accessibility for those potentially with cognitive uh, disabilities or challenges or just general independence of people with disabilities to be able to go and find the products that they need for themselves mm. um, without having to ask for additional support. So I honestly think that there's a knock-on issue of, um, you know, reducing independence for people. And that was my gut reaction the second that I saw this. So, you know, I yes, I absolutely want to help the environment, but there was a much better way to do it. And there's much more wasteful things than the useful products that we're using, such as bags and straws. Mm. Uh, if you had told me 15 years ago that I could walk into a store and buy weed legally, and in a year I'm not going to be able to buy a, get a plastic bag legally, <laughs> I would have told you, like, there's no chance. Like, there's no chance. Uh, okay, and Marco. That's exactly my point. <laughs> Marco, you identified some there, but I want to stay with you before I hand the baton back to Elizabeth. Some of the accessibility concerns that really strike you here, I know the straw tends to be one of the most galvanizing ones. 
Yeah, um, but let's talk about the financial impact here, right? Mm. So in that same article, um, you know, to make this change, the government an an analysis estimates that the program will actually see a net negative in the realm of $1.3 billion. So where is the rest of that money going to be coming from, right? It's going to be impacting on the consumer, which ultimately is then going to impact those with uh, persons with disabilities who are low income, right? So there's so many things and accessibility to food right now is such a real big issue. Accessibility to all of our resources is an issue right now as store shelves are seeing, uh, you know, that they're quite empty. And so how is this going to, uh, you know, impact myself, my friends with disabilities? I mean, I think that the larger impact is still left to be seen. But when you look at a program, uh, like Elizabeth said, and you see that the net negative is going to be $1.3 billion, um, has this really been thought out? You know, that's my question. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth, going back to you here, accessibility concerns that strike you. Yeah. So, I mean, Marco's highlighted some of the cost issues. The other issue um, is this discourse around, well, you can use something else, a paper straw, a metal straw, if we're going to stick with straws, a wooden straw. But there are some serious safety concerns as well as financial concerns. The paper, I don't know if anyone's tried to use a paper straw, they just disintegrate. It's not the answer. Um, and you, yeah, not you the literally answer. are grasping at straws when you're using a oh. paper straw. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Throw in a pun there. But you know, the metal straws, they don't bend in the same way. Uh, cleaning no. straws. And I also just want to move away from straws for a moment and talk about about this other piece of wrapping things in plastic. So we know that that's harmful, but just an alternative thought that for some people, the prepackaged food, there's, there's this sort of you know, meme that's going around that it's very lazy and bourgeois to have an, an orange pre-peeled and packaged or vegetables cut up and packaged. But if we pause and think for a moment about people that may need that for accessibility, so folks who have cognitive mm. disabilities that make it more difficult to prepare food or individuals who aren't able to use a knife or lift a heavy pot. So I think the problem with environmentalism and even environmental justice is, is shaming, naming, and blaming. So you, Marco, or you, Elizabeth, or you, Dave, you're bad. You're using uh, a one size, one time container of oranges and you're throwing it away. But what we're missing there is that for some people that's a necessity. So we're actually, you know, in a movement that's trying to do help, we're doing harm by introducing ecoableism. So this mm. idea that these policies are excluding people, but they're also naming, shaming, and blaming and individualizing. So they're making uh, it an individual responsibility to be environmentally safe. So another example of ecoableism is removing. Um, you know, wheelchair access on sidewalks and making more bike lanes, so making sidewalks more narrow. So I think there's a lot here to unpack around accessibility, and I hope to start seeing the term ecoableism used because I think it's really important in this discourse. And I think the other piece just around accessibility and is, is to think about that for some people, this is this is independence. So this is the difference mm. between them being able to access food or drink or medication on their own and then uh, having to ask for help if, yeah. if that accessibility is not provided so to me like to me that's that's a major driving force that I, I i've i've actually flip-flopped on this issue a couple times over the years because <laughs> of the vitriol surrounding it because some of the mm -hmm. vitriol is so negative it's it's not yeah. productive i've found myself yeah. siding against people with disabilities for being just like too radical in their point of view on this but mm. elizabeth when you identify listen this is about somebody feeding themselves independently this is how they eat you know like like who am i who am i to stand in the way and say no 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 you are wrong right so i i am i am someone who has uh had a little bit of a come to jesus moment on this and and, mm -hmm. and i'm and i'm willing to admit that right i'm willing to admit that i've taken some strong positions on this in the past that were not all issue. the way correct right but that's yeah. because i am someone who also identifies as climate concerned as an environmentalist mm -hmm. as someone who also understands that the way this world works that when a climate catastrophe in the very happens it's people with disabilities who suffer now mm -hmm. that's something that I want changed systematically as well but I also know it's a reality it's changed it's not happening fast enough so as we're talking about the thorniness here Marco any thoughts on how do you strike a balance between accessibility concerns and in my, in the way I've got this written here is a need to limit plastic waste but we can broaden that out about overall environmental concerns 
Yeah, well, I mean, look at renewable resources, right? Uh, for example, you've got hemp-based plastics, and hemp is making a huge recovery um, in the market right now. So you have corn and wheat husk things like forks and knives. So why can't we do the same thing with bags, right? Um, hemp is uh, very easy to reproduce over and over again. It's a natural resource. Um, you know, uh, then it comes down to obviously the larger manufacturers and ensuring their manufacturing process is actually still good for the environment as well. You know, I really don't like this finger pointing that happens to the single consumer that as elizabeth said you're to blame you're to blame when at the end of the day we're just the consumer that are buying the products that are actually readily available to us based on the manufacturers that make those things available so there has to be some onus taken by the manufacturers who are creating these products that actually say wait a minute we're we're the ones creating a bit of an impact here because what we put out in the market is what's being consumed so the more that we start to push alternatives like hemp-based products um that have the malleability of certain types of plastic in ways that say metal straws don't, I think we can find a happy medium there where everybody wins. And perhaps we're not even then going to be in a negative deficit because we can work on things like farming and agriculture to create these alternative resources that will ultimately help the market overall and persons with disabilities in this case. Elizabeth, uh, I want to give you the same opportunity to react to the question in regards to striking a balance between accessibility concerns and a need for overall environmentalist causes or just simply limiting plastic waste. Yeah, I think Marco positioned it very well. I think including all voices at the table in the construction of policy is really important. Looking at it systemically instead of the sort of downloading of responsibility to the individual. I also think, you know, a really big thing when we think about accessibility is, like Marco said, alternatives. So what alternatives are out there? And I think as, as well, the bigger environmental picture, right? So like, is using a plastic straw, and I don't know the answer, when we think about, you know, deforestation and we think about all of the cars on our road and the carbon emissions, like in the in the grand scheme of things, where do we want to put our focus? Mm -hmm. You know, is it okay to have some plastic straws available for people who need them? Yeah, that's you guys are so good at this. It's almost like you should be on a national TV show talking about these issues on the hey, regular. Hey, aren't we on a national TV show talking <laughs> yeah. about these issues? We sure are. We sure are. Are you just in your basement, Dave? What's <laughs> yeah, going yeah. on? It's, it's all an elaborate ruse that I've been putting together for a long time. <laughs> all right, guys, five minutes on the clock here. So we got to be a little bit yeah. quick as we pivot over to the notion of innovation. Marco, you mentioned the idea of using something like hemp making a comeback as an innovation, yeah. as an alternative. Once again, innovation in the accessibility space was on display at CES in Las Vegas. Marco, some of your takeaways from accessible tech at the trade show. Yeah, so personally, I wasn't there, but I have friends who were there who run a YouTube channel at, at, that's focused around persons with disabilities. And I love to hear that uh, CES had a major focus on that. In the, in the directory of vendors this year, they actually had a filter where you could filter out accessible vendors or accessible disability-based products right in the directory at CES. So you could jump through that, which is amazing. Uh, we've all heard things like smart robots coming up over the years, but there was a smart robot they're featured called the AO, A E O, um, that is voice activated. It actually has two arms. It can roll around and carry things. It utilizes two way communication. So if you have any health based concerns, um, you can tell that to the robot and it will actually connect you to emergency professionals. It can also wow. hand you those bags while disinfecting surfaces with the other hand at wow. the same time, wow. which I was just like, wow, wow. that is wow. crazy. Um, there was things like advanced screen readers for Braille displays that were actually on Ooh. display there, which was incredible. Um, but one of the coolest things I saw was a smart chessboard that will allow my friend who uses eye tracker software to um, make the moves in real time for a real physical board. And then using the internet, it will actually move those physical chess pieces for him using the eye tracker so that he could play with somebody around the globe on a physical chessboard where those pieces are actually moving. I was just like blown away by the fact that this is something that can 
happen. He doesn't have to be able to use his own arms to play a physical chess game, whether the person's in person in the same room with him or they're halfway around the world. And the last one I wanted to mention was a really cool wheelchair that I saw being featured called the Skivo Bro. It's a wheelchair that climbs stairs, um, which you know would be a benefit for me because uh, my wife always says I'm not a person with a disability until I'm presented with a set of stairs in my <laughs> case, right? So, um, you know, if I could have a chair that also uh, you know, climb stairs for me. That would be amazing. And then, of course, SwitchBot uh, was out there again. And I have the SwitchBot curtains uh, in my nursery, as you know, Dave, for, for my daughter, Stella, um, which is voice activated. And it's a little robot that helps me open and close my curtains without me getting uh, in and out of my chair. And they were featuring some newer models. So I just love that innovators from around the globe are being encouraged to support people in the disability community to create products that are universally designed that can impact all of us, whether we identify today with a disability or not. And it was just really exciting to see some of these reviews coming down the pipeline. Elizabeth, what's your perception? There was a really cool one that I wanted to very quickly mention, um, your sure. own voice. I don't know if you saw that one, but basically this idea that you can record your voice. So maybe we're not even talking to Dave right now. Maybe it's a bot, <laughs> but you can record your voice and it, it puts a synthesized recording up in the cloud so that if you have a speech difference later on, due to a degenerative disease, or perhaps you have just a short-term disease that's making your voice not usable, you can actually yeah. use this robotic copy of your voice to speak. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, the results are- that in That's incredible. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. No, no, please, Marco, I insist, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, that's incredible. I heard that Bruce Willis was the first celebrity to sell his voice likeness to AI technology. So, you know, there is things like deep faking voices that would concern me, but from a healthcare perspective, that's absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah, I'm excited. It's it's pretty remarkable. I, I shared a couple items after CES as well in terms of like makeup application, uh, robotic yeah, robotic the backpacks. One. Yeah, like you know, it's like it's 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 little <laughs> things and it's big things. It, it, it's remarkable the way in which the gambit that it runs. Okay, we're officially uh, officially almost out of time here, but Marco, I want to give you the opportunity to uh, plug something you have coming down the pipeline as this conversation wraps up. Yes, thank you so much. So Dave, on February 14th at 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time, the organization that I co-founded, Like Ventures, uh, will be hosting our second annual ACT conference, that's Accessibility Conference of Technology. And the conference, we're utilizing it to promote uh, a more equitable world by increasing accessibility for people with disabilities. And our conference this year is a two-hour uh, virtual gathering featuring a panel on the intersection of virtual capital, uh, sorry, venture capital, uh, accessibility, and technology and we're actually going to be awarding our very first pick um, for an organization that's made a significant impact on accessibility. So this is a two hour event. It's virtual. It's free. Um, you can go to like.ventures. Uh, that's the website. It's dot uh, ventures, not dot com. So like dot ventures. Um, and you can register to come to the uh, conference on the 14th. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from some of our panelists in the VC world and how they look to make innovations around the disability community. There are two things in this world that are infinite that we'll never have enough of, space and time, and we are flat out of time for this segment. I wish we had more. Marco, have a great day. You as well, my friend. Elizabeth, thank you as well. Always great chatting with you. You as well, my friend. Bye, Marco. Bye, Dave. That's Marco Pasqua and Elizabeth Moller. Do you want to dive into more conversations like this? Watch Now with Dave Brown weekdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on AMI-tv or download the podcasts wherever you listen. Do you want to dive into more conversations like this? Watch Now with Dave Brown weekdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on AMI-tv or download the podcasts wherever you listen.